Which one's the best crypto asset? Well, Bitcoin's the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There is no second best crypto asset. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Why Bitcoin Show. I'm your host, Dale Warburton. It's a weekly podcast on why Bitcoin matters and what makes it completely different to all other cryptocurrencies. If you're interested in Bitcoin and you'd like to distill crypto fact from fiction, you've come to the right place. All right, the magnificent Peter Dunworth. Welcome for round three of the Why Bitcoin Show. Dale, it's great to be here with you. I feel like laughing, but uh, it's always a, always a pleasure talking with you. Super. Now, I'm really pleased to have you here. I think um, I got a really good feedback from the community on our macro chat in particular. So really thought it was a good idea to unpack some stuff. I know where we left it off last time was, you know, that we're in this strange period in history where it's really difficult to say where things are going and we kind of left it off. Well, it's probably going to be more of the same, but subsequently you and I had a little chat and thought, why not discuss a few of the things that are ongoing in the world? And maybe if I can kick things off there, I did a little bit of work for this one, Pete, because I thought, you know, I'm bringing out the big gun, so I might as well try and bring some data to the fore to uh, to provide a little bit of substance to the conversation, because last time perhaps I wasn't as, uh, you know, as much of a contributor as I would have liked. So, you know, we're sitting here today. What is today now? We are on, I think, is it the 17th? 22nd. The 22nd. God, sorry. Dates are terrible in my mind. Um, you know, gold is just under sort of 1900, up 3.35% year to date. S&P 500 is up 13.8% year to date. And Bitcoin sitting around 26K is at 57% year to date. The current yield on the three month treasury is 5.56 and the 10 year 4.28. I came across an article that I thought could kick things off. Um, and it comes courtesy of the UN, so we can sort of decide whether or not that actually is an issue in itself. But last year, they said global public debt reached an all-time high of $92 trillion. And apparently, 3.3 billion people live in countries where the interest payments on that debt, on the public debt, actually exceed spending on healthcare or education. And the debt itself is literally five times more than it was in 2000. And the argument there is, well, it's typically the developing nations that suffer the most in these times of high levels of public debt because their cost of capital is apparently 4x the UX and 8x a wealthy country in Europe, you know, take Switzerland or whatever. So they reckon like 40% of the developing world has a quote unquote serious debt problem. Let's start with that. <laughs> the world is in debt and the developing nations are going to feel the brunt of it the most. Do you agree with the sentiment? Depends who's asking. And I hate to be cynical here, but I think the UN is basically a, effectively a, a narrative funnel for the IMF and the World Bank. And so those articles I hear, I'm extremely sceptical of when I hear those numbers. And although they may be true, the solution that they put forward to solving those problems would be very different to what I would suggest. And typically the, the suggestion to solving those problems is typically taking out a, a loan from the World Bank or the IMF and restructuring the debt and basically rolling it over, paying whoever's in charge billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars to basically approve the deal, basically get those countries further indebted and then watch those nations' leaders basically piss off with thousands or millions or billions of dollars. And although it might be true, I'd just take a hard default on it and say, we're going to deal with it. And there's a lot of economic mismanagement with debt and you know a lot of people don't want to make a hard decision we in the west don't want to make a hard decision in australia we don't want to make a hard decision the us doesn't <laughs> britain doesn't no one wants to make a hard decision and this is where ironically a lot of those you know developing nations are forced to make a hard decision whether they like it or not and this is where hats off to Bekele for what he's done you know he was pressured uh, no end to take on additional imf debt or restructuring and he turned around and said, no, we're going to create, you know, volcano bonds, which he was lambasted in the media for. And that's turning out to be pretty good. Those, you know, those bonds that he's basically issued, I think, are, you know, the best returning bonds on earth, which, mm. you know, go figure. He had the the fortitude and the mental strength to basically 
fend off, you know, effectively a, a narrative against him and El Salvador that they were going to go broke. People were going to be, you know, in poverty stricken. And, you know, either he's got the world's best marketing team in showing everyone that that is not the case, or alternatively, you know, he's a genius and has managed to, you know, really improve the outlook of El Salvador. He's lifted, you know, tourism numbers. He's cleaned up the the crime statistics. He's got um, GDP absolutely ripping. And there's a whole lot of foreign investment that wants to have a, a piece of that because I think people are basically starting to smell or sniff that, you know, El Salvador could be the equivalent of Singapore 50 or 60 years ago, that this is a, a beacon of hope for, you know, free capital and property rights. So if that's the case, you know, El Salvador's got a very bright future in front of it. 100%. And I, I tend to agree with your assessment of the UN and more so the solutions that they would offer. Um, it might well be the case that, um, that, that, that all those sort of stats that are outlined are true, but it doesn't seem that they are necessarily equipped to provide the right sort of solutions. It did take somewhat uh, a, a somewhat ballsy decision like uh, that that Bukele took to essentially go against what would have been an enormous amount of pressure. I suppose when I look at it too, uh, having come from a develop, developing nation like South Africa, there's always this sort of narrative about him that he's like a bit of an authoritarian and there's always concerns around that. And I'd be more interested to see, and I don't know the specifics of whether or not he's able to get a second term and how does he actually go about achieving that? Because based on what I understand, the likes of Gallup have done polls there and he's really popular. And it's very hard, I think, in the West to get uh, something like a 90% approval rating. But somehow he's imbued this whole country with energy and optimism. And you could you could say that Bitcoin is partially responsible. But at the same time, I also think that he's actually a very charismatic guy who's got um, who's potentially very passionate about the country and recognizes all the sort of flaws that it had before uh, where the gangs were effectively running the show and they had infiltrated judiciary and the legislature and all those kind of things. So I'm really watching it closely and I'm particularly interested in seeing like, can he actually get a second term? That's really what it comes down to from my perspective. But yeah, I think that's a good overall assessment. Now, if we kind of now drill down into kind of the, the US now, some recent stats are that Current national debt's $32.5 trillion. Their fiscal deficit alone is $1.4 trillion, and that's up 170% from last year. Uh, and Treasury still wants to borrow $1.85 trillion for the second half of this year. Tax receipts are down 5% year on year. The interest expense is $970 billion. That is more than the U.S. military of $877 billion, um, and that supports uh, military bases in 85 countries. Yeah. So the idea here is that the U.S. is embarking on somewhat of a debt spiral. James Lavish goes into depth as to how that happens. I know that Greg Foss and Lawrence Lepard have all gone into this in detail. But I suppose it, when you look at those stats, I mean, what is the story telling you? Like, what is your assessment Obviously, it's not sustainable. So immediately, you know, you need to spend less than you were, whether you're a whether you're a household, a person, you know, single person home, a household looking after a family uh, uh, or a nation state, the number one goal for financial security is to make sure you spend less than you earn. And to hear that, you know, that federal budget would probably be $3, billion, uh, $3 trillion over, um, a large contributor to that, a large, you know, a, a huge change or the biggest change in line item uh, across that entire federal budget for the year is effective uh, increase in uh, interest expense for for the debt that they hold, and then they've just basically thrown all caution out the window, where they said, "Yep, we've got another 1.8 billion or whatever it is coming up before the end of the year that we're going to have to issue as well." So, I look at that and think there there sort of needs to be some normalisation around expenses, but no one wants to have a conversation around some form of curbing that that spending or austerity measures, and it's particularly un, unpalatable to think that. At the same time, they're spending billions of dollars in the Ukraine for a war that they're winning, but for whatever reason, they keep needing more and more from. I would have thought if you're winning the war that you need less and less, but, you know, colour me sceptical. I don't think we're getting told the full story there, which is very frustrating because, you know, I think the US is prepared to uh, prepared to fight to every last Ukrainian man, which is a pretty awful thing for that country. It decimates a, an entire middle 
basically, a, you know, all, all the young males are basically going to be put in a meat grinder, you know, to fight a war that quite clearly I'm looking at. They're not winning and they don't have a chance of winning. And the next concern after that is what happens when they run out of Ukrainian men to put in. It's going to be Australian and US and European men to put in there. And it's like, I don't want to know about that. Like, just stop this thing before someone presses, you know, the button on a nuke. Like, this is crazy. So I kind of think that the war is a bit of a sideshow for just how bad the fiscal problem is in the US. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the debt spiral started and that could well be. But, you know, I just never underestimate, you know, some really smart people with the ability to, when their life is on the line or their livelihood uh, is on the line, to come up with ingenious ways of kicking the can down the road. And this is where I look at this and think it, it may be the start of the death spiral, but this death spiral could be going for the next 15 to 20 years. Like there's a whole host of ways that they can do all sorts of you know, financial trickery, uh, accounting trickery. They've already shown that they're prepared to do whatever it takes to deliver the number that they want. And it feels like the US numbers are looking a lot like the Chinese numbers. You know, in finance, we used to joke about the Chinese numbers just not being worth the paper they're written on. Like, what's the number there? Oh, look at the China China Beige book. And basically, the numbers are all completely out of whack. It's like, and the second they get any sort of oversight on those numbers or, or pushback, you know, basically those those numbers that they reported on for the last 10 years just get removed from the beige book and now they're, they're no longer there so no one can ask questions about it. Now, a similar sort of thing is kind of happening in the US, I think, with the numbers that they're putting up. I just don't have any faith in the numbers that they're putting forward and it feels like, unfortunately, that it's a narrative drive first and then they fit the numbers into the narrative. So, mm. you know, this overspending, well, you know, if someone's not telling you the truth, it's very difficult to make any any real decisions because they're not living in reality. And this is the difficulty that I find with making investment decisions today is that I don't think the US is being 100% open and transparent with all of the numbers that they report. And they are very good to readjust the figures six six months down the track. Yeah. And, you know, what you were saying is uh, the willingness of the Fed to step in whenever there are signs of the system breaking, mm. most recently we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, that's what makes me sometimes a bit nervous about our bets on Bitcoin. Because I think to myself, well, in a rational world where households run out of runway and we can't get any more credit card debt and eventually we have to pay the piper. And yeah. this is where the scarce status on earth suddenly becomes infinitely valuable. However, in a world where you can delay and delay and delay, and you can just create different kinds of acronyms and call them different names, is that the Fed puts, uh, as some people like to put it, like um, the, the fact that the, the Fed will always come, come in and save you? Like It's like you're walking across two buildings on a trapeze and there's always a net. So just relax, take risks, guys. That's what it feels like. I think it's been missing. The Fed put's been missing in the last 12 to 18 months. I think there's been a real, like a seismic shift in the fact that Jay Powell has actually come out and going to be, you know, increasing interest rates for the last six, well, 18 months now, he's been doing that. And mm -hmm. although we talked about transitory inflation, the rest of it, he's just basically said, right, we're going to kick this thing up and we're going to move rates from zero to 5.1% in 18 months. This has never been done before. This is a huge kick in the teeth. And what's really interesting, and this is where, the things that don't make sense for me in this market, and this is very confusing, I just ask a lot of questions and hopefully get some answers on it. But, you know, you look at the comparison and I think what's going on is it's okay to talk about the US debt spiral and that's all good and well, but people are still buying those bonds. And the reason why they're buying those bonds is because they're issuing them at, you know, like the overnight bond, you know, the overnight rates at 5% and their current inflation rates at 32 Let's call it a net positive real return today of 2%. And when you compare that to Europe, they're paying somewhere around probably 3% for their interest overnight. And they've got a 7% inflation rate. So there's a negative 4% real return. Now, as bad as the debt spiral is, it's worse everywhere else. So people are still going to be buying the US debt over the European debt or Japanese debt because it's a positive real carry on it. And yeah. this is where... This thing can go on in my mind for a lot longer than everyone thinks because as bad as the debt spiral is in the US, some of the stuff everywhere else is is shocking. It's worse. So a positive real return of two sounds horrible, but when you put that in, in contrast to a negative real return of 4% or more, 
positive 2% sounds really good. I think that's really spot on. And, you know, it's sometimes when we're sitting here in Australia and we're watching, you know, on Twitter, the fights that are happening and we, we listen to all the sort of the doomsday is talking about how the, the US is going to hell in a handbasket. And sure, there's a lot of signs that socially it's fragmenting. It's a lot of, lot of division, political division. Now we've got an election year coming up and we know what sort of circus that leads to. We also know that um, the inflation numbers that are coming out are not necessarily true. We know that that particular basket of goods gets manipulated constantly. But with all that said, Europe looks to be in a far worse position. Africa is certainly in a far worse position. And I guess there's probably parts of Asia too that are in a pretty bad state. So all things considered, I think the US is probably, as you say, I mean, it's it's, it's such a... It's become trite, but it's like the cleanest shirt in a dirty laundry. So people are yeah. still going to be buying U.S. debt. Um, and so that's why when people go, you know, oh, the U.S. dollars are shit coin. It's like, well, you know, have you traveled? Like, have you looked at other currencies? They're not doing well. Even the Aussie dollar of late, which we can touch on a bit later, if you like, um, has 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 taken a bit of a, a beating of late. I wanted to play something now. Let's just talk a bit of inflation because I wanted to play a little clip here um, that might actually ring a bell. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope it actually comes through here. But let's see. Um Let's hear. Let's hear from Jay Powell as to why two percent is the is the target for the general public, for those working families of people. Why two percent? Why is getting it to two percent so important? Um, so that's that has become the globally agreed, <clears throat> essentially all major central banks target two percent inflation in one form or another. Um, and uh, it, how does that help my Nevada families? How does that help people in Nevada? I'll tell you how it does, and it, it it's. Um, I guess it's it's obviously not uh, it's not obvious how that is, but it, what two percent inflation to have people believe that inflation is going to go back to two percent really anchors inflation there because you know the evidence is is and and the, the modern belief is that people's expectations about inflation actually have a real an effect on inflation. If you expect inflation to go up five percent, then it will. You know, if everyone kind of expects that because that's what businesses and households will be expecting and, and it will kind of happen because they expect it. So having a 2% inflation goal, where which we had for many years. All right. We don't have to go too much further. There. But uh, <laughs> so when you hear the 2%, Pete, and then I saw an article today in the Wall Street Journal that said, we should actually now be going for three. What is your assessment as to why 2%? Like, <laughs> what is going on here? I, I had trouble hearing it on my end, but I'm presuming it was the the reference to his testimony to Congress as to why, when he was grilled about that, why 2% was the number that they came up with. Um, yes, yes, it was. Sorry, I didn't know that you couldn't hear. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure uh, from memory if his answer actually basically referenced the New Zealand economist that said back in the 1970s that for an ideal economy, we need 2%, but it, it was something different from memory to that. And this is where that whole 2% from my understanding came from a New Zealand economist 50 years ago that said that's the ideal way to play it. And and this is where, you know, I'm constantly reminded when I'm listening to these guys talking about, you know, they absolutely have no idea. 2%, 3%. I saw a great Twitter post from Andy Edstrom um, who responded to Paul Grugman's 3% with the number four. I like four better. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this is fundamentally where we're at, where I feel like, you know, that joke that is so old now from an accounting perspective is is new again, where, you know, all of these guys are basically telling you whatever they want it to be. And, and this is where the accounting joke is, how do you know you've got a good accountant? Ask them what one plus one is. If they're any good, They'll look over their shoulder, close the blind, and then they'll whisper in your ear, in your ear, what do you want it to be? And this is where Paul Krugman, Jay Powell, all of these economists are basically suffering from being really good accounts that, well, whatever the number is that we need it to be, we're going to say it is. And this is where if if you if you were to calculate the cost of 3% inflation on a global basis, on you know, that's just the US, but the global inflation rate is probably running higher than 10%. Now, if you think about this in dollar terms, what 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 does that actually mean? Like it, to to us, the layperson, when we hear inflation, all we know is we go to the supermarket and basically our meat's gone up a little bit, the veggies have gone up, and on a bad day, it's like, oh, that's actually maybe twenty percent up. But what does it actually mean in in real terms, in monetary terms? There's roughly a hundred trillion dollars worth of you know U.S. dollars and equivalent floating around the world. 
on a 10% inflation rate, that represents $10 trillion per annum. This is basically lost purchasing power, $10 trillion. Now, people talk about robbing banks, but, you know, robbing $10 trillion from all of us, I guess it's not a crime if you rob everyone. This is the problem. Yeah. That, you know, so a, a 2% via 3% inflation rate, well, that's just another trillion on the bottom line. And, you know, Larry Leppard had some funny comments to make as well, like, well, why don't you make it 15 or 1,500? Who cares? And, yeah. and and this is the frustrating thing because, you know, there's a lot of really hardworking people at the moment who are suffering and they're trying to make the right decisions. They're doing everything they've been told. They went out, they bought a property. Philip Lowe at the end of uh, December 2021 basically said, we're not going to have a rate rise till 2024. Within six months, he's basically started jacking up rates and we've had rates move from 0.25 to 4.1% in less than 12, 12 months. So less than 18 months of him saying we're not having a rate rise and now we're about to get into the consequences of all of these fixed rates rolling over and it's going to get really, really ugly in Australia. And this is where mm -hmm. you couple the interest rate expense. You know, we've got clients who are rolling rates from a 2% to a 6% and their cost yeah. of capital, their, their mortgages are more than doubling. And then in addition to that, they've had the cost of, you know, putting food on the table go up 50% in the last three years. Like where, where does the money come from? Yeah, it's it's actually quite baffling. And you think about that specific issue, what you know, one why two percent, one of three, one of four. It seems as if it's it's almost like in the context of like a retailer, there's a bit of slippage. Like we people can afford to lose two percent of their purchasing power per annum. It's a, without kicking up a fuss. It's almost like that's what they've kind of agreed, the politicians and, and the policymakers. They've kind of gone like if your money's just melting at two percent per per annum, then it's less likely gonna cause trouble. Like we don't want that creeping into the double digits. That's when people actually really notice. Um, and so that's kind of my, you know, layperson, non-financial, non-accountant kind of perspective. It's just, it feels quite arbitrary. There are a whole bunch of things that they would say, like, you know, it's, it stimulates the economy by getting people to borrow and then they invest in businesses and they employ people and blah, blah, blah. But for the average person who's just trying to store their wealth and save for the future it, it certainly doesn't it doesn't help and what we also know is that it is it's a um it's a regressive tax on the poor in the sense that they're the ones who actually feel the brunt of it i mean i don't think warren buffett's that upset about you know even 10 percent inflation it's not going to change his lifestyle but if you're kind of living hand to mouth as it is those little swings can really push you into the negative and suddenly now you're going to have to take on expensive debt uh, to just to keep a roof over your head as an example. And I see it in the U S credit card debt is hitting some of the highest levels they've ever seen. And so, you know, and we know that's like 20% or so, I mean, that's just horrific type of debt. You don't want that kind of debt in your life. And so, yeah, I think um, the average person is who actually gets screwed in the system. Uh, the ordinary person who's, well, I guess the person who's in the inside, who's got assets, they're increasing, you know, above the so-called inflation rate, which we know is probably BS. They're kind of more immune to it, but yeah, it's it's kind of baffling, especially when you get posed the question. And I, I'm sorry for not playing that properly. I've never tested that on a on a call before, <laughs> but I, I, I'd seen it, but I just couldn't hear it. Yeah, I guess as much, but I get you know, it's just the inability to give a straight answer. Like, imagine you're just a person sitting there in the Midwest. And you just want to get a straight answer. Why 2%? Just tell me, like, explain to me like I'm five. And the guy who runs the show can't give you a straight answer. He's dancing around in circles because it's never dawned on him that somehow this can be challenged. And that's what's so outrageous about the whole idea. You know, you mentioned earlier there, Pete, you know, aside from the inflation targets and whatnot, we know that sort of in, in May of 2019, you know, CPI was 1.9%. And they were talking at the time, well, uh, you know, forget inflation, we should actually be worried about deflation. And then, you know, COVID hits and all that kind of stuff. And then, well, it's just transitory. And there's a, an article, and I'm gonna put all of these articles in the show notes, but 179 reasons you probably don't need to panic about inflation. <laughs> and then in late 21, Powell goes, well, we got it right. Uh, you know, sorry, we got it wrong on inflation. Um, it's no longer transitory. But then it was all about, well, you know, it's the lingering effects of supply chain constraints. And I just kept on hearing that excuse when it comes to inflation and go like, that sounds like the equivalent to me of, 
we are currently experiencing high call volumes, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, 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 you've just underinvested. <laughs> Stop <laughs> lying. <laughs> so I, I, I was thinking it's more along the lines of, oh, the dog ate my homework. <laughs> yes, well, it's the same. same exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's just like you can't fool all the people all the time. And I think there's enough people that are starting to get wiser to it. Uh, to circle back to to the whole um, to Ukraine because uh, let's just have a little dabble in geopolitics into in, into it. Um, you know, I, one of the things I saw that was quite clear, and I, I've said this now in hindsight, is that the sort of pandemic to me felt like a corporatized response. Um, it was there was a clear corporate agenda that was being driven from the top down across all the governments. Like we've never seen such coordination in our lives. Yeah. Now you've got this military industrial complex, which shockingly needs wars in order to be able to grow and become profitable, just like the medicine companies do, right? So, you know, it, it doesn't strike me as like that surprising that there's almost this incentive to go for war. And what's most surprising is that it was usually the Democrats who were on the other side of the of the of the fence? That it was the warmongering neocons, uh, the George From Bush the Republicans. Yeah. Yes, and now it's like no, no, we all like war because they all just fund our campaigns. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, you can you can dress it as much as you like, but there's um, it's quite obvious to me as well that there's also a play being made mm. uh, in in terms of being able to then. You know, you kind of create a war and then suddenly, well, we need to build all this infrastructure, don't we? And it just is so fishy. It's fishy AF that we've also got um, sleepy Joe Biden's son. You know, he was involved in endless deals with Ukrainian companies in, in, in a space that he has absolutely no experience. I mean, like imagine yeah. someone saying, Dale, we need you to go and work in on rocket ships in Bosnia. Or, you know, it's just like that's not going to happen. <laughs> with <our> corruption. <laughs> Hang on, for eighty six thousand dollars a month, you could put on a good show for that. <laughs> I'd probably do it, Pete. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'll go. I'll I'll go and get involved there. But it's just it it speaks to like a level of like moral decay and like fragmentation, and it's so surprising in some ways and not in others, because the US likes to portray itself as the good guys, and what I keep telling people who are still seeing this red, blue, or you know, US, Russia, or whatever the fight of the day is. I'm like, no, no, it's like, I think there are not many good guys. Like, I don't see there as being good guys and bad guys, or, you know, the Democrats are bad and the Republicans are good, or, you know, vice versa. It's just, I feel like there's people who, it's kind of like it's top down. It feels like it's very centralized versus sort of people from the ground up. I don't know, what's your assessment of that? Like, I mean, does that sound, does it ring true at all? Yeah, it feels like last of days to me that it's a money grab for everyone in every position. So you had in November 2021, you had a two, I think it was two Federal Reserve board members were asked, were basically stood down for insider trading. You know, this is a, you know, the, the most esteemed financial position one could have be given. And they were happy to throw it away for making a few dollars on a stupid trade. I'm like, they're already multi, multi-millionaires and they're either that stupid or naive or ignorant to think that people are going to cop that. And this is where, you know, the concern around the Ukraine, I'm going to say something wildly unpopular, but on both sides of politics, and I'm, I'm not sort of getting political on this, but, you know, the, what, what Hunt has done, it looks and stinks. It looks horrible. You know, there is uh, conjecture around Joe Biden being involved in it and being his right-hand man, and Hunt is just the bag man for it, which looks horrible too. And then on the le- on the right hand side of politics, you've got Trump. He doesn't look so great either. So for me, I, given that my primary concern is you know avoiding a nuclear war, my immediate concern would be give all of those presidential candidates a, a presidential pardon and their children and their families, whatever it's needed, as long as they basically piss off and ride into the sunset, never to come back. And that would hopefully de-escalate things because I think what's happening in the Ukraine is a direct function of the amount of heat that the Bidens and Trump are getting in at home. So if we escalate this war on a foreign shore, the media's kind of got to cover that. And a nuclear war is far more interesting than finding out your president was on the take from the Ukrainians and the 200 or 400 billion that you've sent them was really to cover your ass on all of the bribes that you 
took over there. So for me, I'm just like, let's just get us out of this situation over there as bad as it is. It's only getting worse and I don't see how we win this. So my immediate concern is get out of a war zone and get some stability back to that region where we're not, you know, finger happy, you know, trigger happy with a, a nuclear warhead. That's that's catastrophic for me. And it makes everything else look inconsequential as far as the risks go. And when you, you know, you're looking at assessing what the risks are, that's the number one concern. Basically, someone gets trigger happy with a nuke and basically sends one off because once one starts, you don't stop at one. It's just a free for all. So, mm. you know, um, I just think there's a lot of bad things going on. Give everyone a presidential pardon and tell them they've got to run right off into the sunset, never to return to public life. And hopefully that helps de escalate things. So, yeah. Mm. Interesting. Not popular, not popular and never going to happen. So, no, it, it certainly wouldn't happen. Yeah. And um, they're, they're always going to weaponize what the other guy's done. You know, I tend to think that, I mean, next year is going to be really fascinating if we sort of just go down the political route for a second. We, you know, I think, yeah, Trump being who he is, he, he, he certainly, I don't think he's even going to participate in the in, in the um, debates. I just don't think, I think he feels like he's above it. I think he feels like he won previously anyway. So, you know, why should I participate? If I were to say who's likely to, who's less likely to uh, get into war or who's more likely to stop funding the war i'd probably bet on trump not to say anything positive about the fellow he's obviously a narcissist but you know in his in his term I, I, i'm not aware of him starting or getting involved in any foreign conflicts i think for the most part he just wants to look after america first and uh you know well that's at least what he <laughs> purports to do but i think that's his shtick like i care about america i don't give a shit what happens in these other countries so Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but yeah, it, uh, irrespective, it's going to be fireworks because I, I look on the Democrat side, I'm like, who's going to run? You, you're certainly not going to put Joe there. I mean, he's just, he's pretty much dead. All the, the stuff that I've been listening to of late has, is, is saying that all of these little drips and drabs of corruption, just these little, like, you smell that? It's a little bit of corruption there, guys. Um, it's all just priming Joe to say, listen, boy, you don't run again, okay? We're going to bury you. We have so much filth in you, you wouldn't believe. But we're going to yeah. put up this works to Gavin Newsom, who uh, kept California safe uh, during Corona. And so uh, there's people like him sitting in the wings, I think. I mean, I don't think Kamala knows left from right. So I wouldn't, I'm not too, I don't think she's going to run. But it's, it's quite baffling. Like if you think about who's going to run, you've got like an exhausted former reality TV star, narcissist fella on the one hand, and then you've got like just this incredibly corrupt crew. And I can't see any like meaningful leaders. Let's talk about um, some of the politicians that talk about Bitcoin though. I mean, do you do you think it's just opportunism? Like just trying to say like, um, uh, you know, let's try and win over a portion of the electorate because we know they care or do you think they actually get it? So does like RFK get it or um, what's that other, Vivek, does he get it? No, I think it's just popular. And the Bitcoiners are a very vocal minority and they can make your life absolutely miserable if you don't want to support what they're supporting. And if you do support them, you might pick up for some free Bitcoin and some some free handouts. You know, they're a pretty rowdy bunch on Twitter and Twitter is where a lot of the, you know, the narratives start. So, you know, I think you get a free kick, free press, you know, free hit by supporting Bitcoin. Vivek's done it. RFK Jr.'s done it, but if you look at RFK Jr.'s, you know, political record, I don't think his values completely align with Bitcoin. I know he talks about the fact that they do, but personally, I don't think they do. He's said some pretty outspoken things about climate changes, uh, climate change, and the you know the changes that he'd make and force upon people. And I'm like, that's antithetical to what Bitcoin stands for, which is in in my book, Bitcoin stands for you do you. Basically, you're free to do whatever you want and um, mm. let's just hope that we have common interests that align that move us forward. And being told what to do is one of my pet peeves. So hearing politicians say that you have to do something, it's like, <laughs> glorious. That uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a no for me. So Okay. No, that's fair enough. I mean, yeah. I, I, and um, I suppose the, in, the benefit is also that we've also, we've got a, there's a track record of things that, you know, he's been saying, endorse, et cetera, et cetera. So we can actually go, like, 
it's not what you say, but let's have a look at what you've done in the past. And do you seem like somebody who puts freedom first and foremost? It's, maybe it's not obvious that you do. Yeah. But um, I think, say, Vivek, I think is a different one. I think he's the most opportunistic politician we've seen and running the best campaign of our time. He is unbelievable at gaining free attention and picking up what I call free money on the table. I mean, and he is on everything. So I think Bitcoin's just an easy, easy pickup for him. You know, there's very little downside. There's not too many people who really hate Bitcoin, but there's a few people who really love it and are really passionate about it. So, you know, on the you know, risk return trade-off, I think it's a free kick for him to do it. So yeah, he seems like a free markets guy, but again, I just think it's, I think he's a very calculated politician who is excellent at delivering a message that stirs up the Republicans in, in the best of ways from their side. He delivers the message that they want to hear. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember, I think I might have shared this to you, the story once offline, but, um, you know, I, I once had a little bit of a, a verbal altercation with uh, someone uh, when I described um, politicians as actors because I just don't think that I think they're pretty much as they're one in the same, because if you're an actor, I mean, and I've, I've seen a little bit of old Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. I mean, like you watch you watch the trial of it and you go like, God, I don't know where you begin and where your character ends or, you know, it's, it's yeah. all kind of mesh into one. And I think the same is for virtually every single politician. And maybe that's just a little too cynical. Maybe there are some good folks out there but i think for the most part like it seems as if the game is you come in very optimistic maybe naive you know hope and change whatever whatever your sort of narrative is and then suddenly the machine sort mm -hmm. of just says hey hold on this is not how the game's played if you, you you owe nancy another this and this and this otherwise she's not supporting you on x and y but hold on i ran on x and y no 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 you don't understand I've promised Jay and, you know, this person that they'll get this role if you do this. But hold on. You don't actually, you can't control no. anything. It's actually just, it's a big club and you're not part of it. And it's all, it's all an act. It's not real. That's my yeah. take. <laughs> you know what? I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I might add one thing to it. You know, it's, it's acting for ugly people, right? So... <laughs> They can't get a job in Hollywood, so it's it's Washington. But um, on, on a serious, well, on a non-serious note, you know, I, I say this very tongue-in-cheek, but um, you know how a politician's lying? No. Their mouth is moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, look, you know, I, I don't blame the politicians. I think everyone goes in there with the intent to change the world for the better and they've got their morals and their values and that have basically pushed them to that point that they feel motivated to do it. Um, they feel it's a sense of civic duty that they have to you know, push whatever their cause is forward and are prepared to do whatever they can to do that. And this is where, you know, it's really important to understand what the incentives are because show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. And understanding what politicians' incentives are on the way in are, I think, a really important thing to understand because if you understand what their key drivers are, then you're going to understand what decisions they're making and, and why they're making them. So it makes things a whole lot easier. And this is where the uniparty or the you know two-party preferred system in basically across uh, Western nations now, it's practically a uni, uniparty that you know their, their sole job is really getting re-elected and then everything else is a distant second. And this... I think has been a degradation of the character of, of the politicians that we elect. No longer are they doing it because there's a sense of civic duty and the rest of it. For them, it's a career path for a lot of people to uh, receive untold riches that they'd never otherwise be able to achieve in public life or private life. Spot on, man. Spot on. I mean, you know, old Nancy Pelosi is one of the most magnificent traders um, and uh, yet uh, you, you can't imagine her actually being able to do that in the private sector. Yeah, it, it, it really does speak to the sort of the fact that once something turns into a career, suddenly all the incentives change. And I think you can say the same about, dare I say, like religion. You know, mm -hmm. you, you never used to get paid if you were a priest or whatnot, but yeah, the it, it a career necessarily corrupts the the civic calling or whatever you might call it uh, to either of those kind of professions. Um, so, yeah, it, it's in that sense, it, it's not surprising. I think what's what's most upsetting to me though is the fact that it's so obvious to 
you know, perhaps folks like us, we're watching it and we're going, yeah, okay, I'm not going to get riled up. But so many people's identity is linked to this these days. I mean, here in Australia, I think we're about to encounter our own little Brexit moment, <laughs> you know? You're like, which way did you vote, Dad? Oh, you're bloody racist. And you're like, no, 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 guys, it's complex. And you're like, shut up, get out of here. You know, and like, I mean, you know, you think about, uh, like people have have sort of pinned their identity to their political affiliation. And so do you think there's some sort of like tie there between, uh, you know, the more people have started becoming, you know, their, their, their political life has become sort of wrapped up into who they are as a person, as we've seen less religion. I mean, do you think we know, what's your thoughts around that? Cause that's, that's like a theory that goes, uh, that I've seen about. This is probably one of my most unpopular opinions, but I'd say absolutely. There's been a moral decay with the degradation of of the church. And we've seen the church replaced by the state. And, you know, you look no further than what sort of, you know, what the charitable, you know, organisations used to, used to do for communities. And they were the huge, you know, they were the largest provider of care and welfare services for the communities. And then, inch by inch the government has basically overstepped a mark to to take on that that responsibility by increasing our taxes. I was in New Zealand maybe close to 20 years ago now and I was watching the TV where on the national news they talked about how back in 1966 I think it was there were two people on unemployment benefits in the country and I thought imagine being one of those two losers <laughs> having their hand out <laughs> And I, I say that tongue in cheek because obviously people fall on hard times and need help. But back then, there was a very different mentality. If you had your hand out, you needed to be doing an exceptional amount of work to try and rectify that situation of being unemployed, attending job opportunities, going for job interviews, things like that. And when the state pays you, it is very easy to get entitled with that payment on a regular basis. However, when a charitable donation in your community and is actually paying you and you're receiving either food, shelter or cash from someone who's in your community, it's almost a shaming effect rather mm. than an entitlement. And this is where, as the state has encroached more and more on those welfare services, there's a sense of entitlement that we're all deserved of it or that we're entitled to it. And this is where you know I look at the huge social shift from, say, the 50s or 60s or prior to that, basically the church did a lot of the welfare. So if you were hard on your luck, if you lost your job, if you had something like that, your neighbours would get around you and support you. You know, they'd basically feed you while till you got back on your feet. And because there was that that social consciousness of, you know, accepting that help, accepting that help also brought a responsibility and an accountability from the community that you're expected to do everything you can to rectify the situation as quickly as possible. When, when you go to the ATM and take money out, you don't owe anyone anything. That ATM is going to spew money out every week at you. And, you know, why would you feel bad? You're not looking into anyone's eyeballs to, you know, feeling ashamed for taking money from someone. And this is the thing that I think the church and the, you know, the, the community did a really good job of helping people out and also gave that accountability and everyone was invested in making sure that person got back on their feet. Whereas now, you know, there are whole suburbs of people who literally are trained to maximise the returns from the state without ever working. So back to that, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. Yeah. Like the baby bonus was fundamentally a disaster. You know, basically you've got young kids like, teenagers basically having as many babies as they can because they were getting a five grand check from the government well how does that help society you know it brings yeah. it's a, a practical permanent enslavement in that community they don't learn how to go out and fend for themselves and they think that if they have more babies they get paid more yeah you know, and look at the it's you know, yeah it's baffling hey pete i mean the because it it, it it i suppose what they were thinking is we need to try and promotes a you know a higher growth rate and because we need you know taxpayers in the future but what you're obviously not thinking about is the secondary consequences and perhaps this was more couldn't have been more evident than during the pandemic uh, you know the second order effects no one's contemplating them it's all sort of surface level analysis here 
And so, yeah, I mean, who would have guessed that people would be incentivized just to pop one out and keep popping them out? And the chances of that becoming a viable source of revenue for the government is approximately nil. You know, no, no one would have done that because the incentive there was just to do something that made it appear as if you were addressing the real problem because you want votes and the yeah. actual outcome is less important than the appearance of caring. Yeah. And yeah. you know what's funny? You compare this with you compare this with what Hungary does. If you have four children, you're tax free. You have no income tax to pay for the rest of your life. And it's like all of a sudden there is a very high incentive to produce four children and then go and earn as much money as possible because they know although they might be getting any income tax from you, they'll be taking a large amount of sales tax from you. So yeah. I look at that but and I think, smart. you know, I mean, it, it creates a much better feedback loop for, for society to do it one way via the other. So that's enough of my social commentary. It'll get, I'll get myself in trouble. No, but there's nothing you said that I think, uh, I don't think it's that controversial. I mean, it's 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 perfectly rational. Like the minute you start, people that sort of oppose it, it's, it's I think you're going to struggle when you start hitting reality because, you know, to give you an example, my folks who were recently in New Zealand and they met this dude who was like, he used to work, you know, in the one of the social welfare departments. And part of his job was doing due diligence to make sure that those who were sort of, claiming unemployment benefits were actually going out there and ticking all the boxes. Right. And, and and they've become really good at that. They were like, you know, it's like, do this, do this, do this. And these people are like trained because they know exactly I need to do this and I'll get paid. So there was this one individual and they couldn't figure out why she couldn't get a job. Like they were like, this woman goes to more interviews than anyone else and blah, blah, blah. So he actually followed her and she was going into interviews in her pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like an automatic disqualification it's just like i couldn't give a shit i'm rocking up in my pjs and you're not going to do anything about it so so um but yeah i mean it, it, it's so obvious and you know i think it, it, here we at least have the benefit of enough taxpayers that can make a certain that viable for a certain segment of society. I mean, you take a country like South Africa, where you've got sort of more than I think 23 million out of 65 million who don't pay a single cent in income tax. The, you know, you, you've you've got a very small tax base, and then the tax base that you do have is hugely skewed towards a group that get little to no benefits from the state. The whole social contract's broken, but they have to fund essentially tens of millions of people's lifestyles who feel entitled to it and, you know, think, well, but for all these evil capitalists, I'll be driving a Mercedes, you know, so what's going on? It's quite funny because I've just found things like here, you know, uh, like healthcare, incredibly poor. Like, I mean, I obviously I've come from South Africa and I had private healthcare there and it was world-class here. It's just like, Oh man, it's such a struggle. I haven't enjoyed it. Um, but there's an interesting book I would actually direct people towards. Um, this guy called Dominic Frisbee. He's a libertarian. Um, mm. And it's called like uh, Daylight uh, Robbery. And it really just right, talks right. about, yeah, you have, you've read it, eh? I've skimmed through it and there are just some, fab, like it is just a fabulous account. Dominic Frisbee is one of my favorites. I mean, yeah. tell the story about Daylight Robbery. I just, I, I love the term and love the story behind it. Oh yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it's brilliant. So I mean, I actually forced my wife to listen to this um, audio book on one of our longest road trips, <laughs> and so she was, she was like really excited to listen to something, and then I was like, we're gonna learn about tax. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it actually, it's. I mean, it's fundamentally about okay, and even going back to biblical times, it's about ten percent more or less was the the tithing, the tax of the day, and the government's role was largely restricted to. Sa uh, safety and defense and protection of private property. I think it literally, I mean, and maybe a bit of infrastructure, like, you know, sewage and whatnot. But then it started encroaching and then it was healthcare and then it's schooling and then it's, you know, social welfare and blah, 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 blah. But the title Daylight Robbery actually comes from the uh, fact that at one point, houses were being taxed on the basis of how many windows they had. And so would you believe it? Again, incentives. People just started boarding up all their windows 
And then they got vitamin <laughs> vitamin D deficiencies. So they never saw the bloody light. And um, they, they, they refer to the sort of tax as daylight robbery because they weren't able to actually have windows because they get taxed for windows. I mean, you know, uh, it's just, it's quite baffling. But if you think of the 10% and then you start sort of look at today's nation state and like just an average nation state, you take something like New Zealand, which is not even that bad. I mean, their top tax rate is 33%. So, you know, another way of thinking about your tax is how many days of the year do you actually work for the government? And then in, in parts of like, you know, like my mates in Sweden, I'm like, oh yeah, no, it's great there. But, you know, literally 60% of the year you're working for the government. Yeah, I don't like that idea. Yeah. I, I, I don't think anyone does. And this is the problem that I think people want to be rewarded for their hard work. And what's what's difficult is, is that there needs to be a sense of fairness. One One of the concerns I've got, which might be a topic for another day, but, you know, in really rough terms, 50% of the US expenditure will be like, sorry, 50% of the GDP for the US is expected to come from the government by the year 2050. Like, wow. that's not that far away. That's 27 years away. And half of the US GDP is coming from the US government. Like, this is insane. Like, the tax base is completely out of, out of kilter. Like, to your point earlier about the, you know, the problem with South Africa taxpayers, that's a problem that's here as well. We've got the same problem that there aren't enough taxpayers really paying tax for, you know, the obligations that we've got, and this is a problem that's going to continue to grow because of the aging Western, you know, Western democracies basically have got horrible demographics, not as bad as China or Japan, but we're not in a great way, and this is where you know part of you know importing nine hundred thousand workers is meant to change that skew a little bit, but still it's a it's a horrible horrible way to do it and. Um, I heard a shocking stat during COVID. Nearly 73% of the population was a net receiver of benefits from the government rather than contributor. Wow. I mean... That's wild. That's that's highly unsustainable. And, you know, we mm. look at the US and think their problem's bad. It's bad all over. Like, everywhere is bad. It's not a good... No one wants to take the medicine. And the fact is we can't really take the medicine. So... It's a it's a game of chicken and whoever blinks first loses. So everyone's just in a print to infinity and we'll just have a debt jubilee at some point in time in the future is what I expect to happen. Yeah. Yeah, it does feel a bit like that. And um, yeah, to bring this sort of full circle now, a little bit of Bitcoin talk, because uh, the talk of the Bitcoin town is obviously that um, it was 26,000 more or less now. That's come off a little bit since... Uh, the 30,000 or 31 that was sitting out in for like six months or so. And word on the tweet is that um, this is partially inspired by the fact that uh, CZ is busy offloading Bitcoin, trying to defend BNB, the exchange token, because below something like 210 US, there's just like a ton of leveraged liquidations that's, that um, is going to potentially result in their demise. So, do you have any any insight into that there, Pete? Or is it just like, who cares? There's just, <laughs> Bitcoin doesn't care. Burn it to the fucking ground. Like, <laughs> may, maybe maybe not quite that. But look, I kind of get the feeling that, um, you know, Binance looks and smells and feels a whole lot like FTX and the situation that went through when I think it was Caroline came out and said, we're good for $23 or $24, whatever yeah. stupid comment was. And then the traders literally just pounced on it and dashed it, then set it straight past that. It's like, thank goodness CC doesn't have anyone so stupid working for him. Otherwise, his job would be made a whole lot harder. <laughs> yeah, um, totally. But I, I, I sincerely think, and this is where, you know, in the grand scheme of things, what happens with Binance is of no significance whatsoever. I think the next sort of two months is going to be really rocky. And I think towards the back end of October, we'll basically be through a lot of the volatility and that'll be um, Larry Fink and his mates have picked up as much Bitcoin or cheap Bitcoin as they can. And then we can get on with preparing for the next two years in front of us. So whatever happens with Binance will happen. If you've got your coins on exchange, any exchange, but particularly Binance, like, Gosh, run! Get them off exchange. Send them to another exchange. Any exchange, like that—that's probably going to be better than 
Binance at the moment because there's a lot of things that are lining up. And I don't want to cast any dispersions here, but there's no other inferences to make other than it looks very similar to the setup to FTX and what led to the ultimate demise there. You had their own token that they basically created, FTT. Binance has got BNB. You had that um, have a precipitous fall and BNB's had a precipitous fall. So in addition to that, you know, there's talk of leverage and all sorts of things. And Binance is in a position where it could be, you know, quite volatile and unstable if if they don't get that under control because of the talk that there's huge leverage around the BNB token, which basically it's as good as air, really. It's not worth the paper it's written on. In my books, I wouldn't accept it for anything. I'd take Venezuela and Bolivar over that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a, and I saw a tweet the other day. I thought it just it rang so true. It was like, you know, can't these individuals just not be such absolute greedy pigs? Because all they have to do is run a shitcoin casino. They don't need their own exchange token. They don't have to play with leverage. They can just let people, you know, trade, you know, dog money or you know Solana or whatever other crypto you, of the day and then they can just collect fees like it's really simple but yeah. for whatever reason these people's like the the composition of their brain is such that they feel the need to absolutely optimize and exploit it and like it's literally like snatching defeat from the jaws of victory like you know maybe between you and I we wouldn't necessarily have the moral compass to go and you know engage in that sort of you know chicanery in terms of selling absolute bullshit to people but that's all they have to do and they can't even do that right because they have to play games with stupid exchange tokens and like yeah i i i agree with your assessment i mean look in the long run it's like it's a little piece of you know dust in the cosmos who cares but um in the short term it might just suck a little bit of the wind from some of the momentum that we I felt like we were enjoying subsequent to BlackRock and all the all the big boys saying, come on, let's do this. Um so yeah, we'll see. But yeah, I I actually just put a little thing on Facebook today. I was like, this is not a drill. Get your Bitcoin off Binance. And one guy was like, okay, what's happening there? So I just put a tweet and he's like, I guess I'll be removing my my stuff there. It's like, I've done one good thing today. <laughs> just one, you know. <laughs> if just one coin comes off the exchange, that's a that's a good deed for the day. It's funny. Yes. I, I was expecting you to tell me that posting that on Facebook, someone turned around and was going to call you a conspiracy theorist or all the like. <laughs> well, no, I wish. Um, in fact, my I've got my little fake character who causes chaos in the uh, Facebook and Instagram realm because um, it's CryptoCon in melbourne uh, i think it's around the same time as the bush bash um which i assume you're going to and um yeah and uh I'm, i just always just i just post absolute like i just troll just troll non-stop and uh, I, I then try to go find my comments and it's always deleted it's always exactly. yeah yeah it's just then, um tell me this conference that's competing with the bush bash psychedelic buttholes are they <laughs> going to be having their nft released <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they do. Uh, an exclusive limited edition 2023 new battles. <laughs> Come on. No, I mean, honestly, like uh, I always say, these are not serious people. These are not serious people. They're not thinking big picture. These are just yeah. um, fiat maxis and they're just taking the piss. Uh, they're either that or they're just completely stupid. I, I don't know. And I don't know which is which, um, but I, anyway. I, I, I look at it and think it's a fiat brain. These people are playing short-term games for short-term results and sacrificing their reputations for such things. And it's a very short-lived win. It's a, yeah. it's quite a hollow victory. And this is where, you know, those sorts of things, uh, people remember you for that. And this is where I think long-term people will remember the fact that we've only talked about Bitcoin and push Bitcoin you know, for many years now. And it's the only thing that's investable from a long-term basis from my perspective. And and this is where, you know, only talking about Bitcoin in light of all the conversations that we've had today that I don't think we've really talked on that I think is probably the most critical thing is that basically Bitcoin allows an alignment of interests from everyone in society, from the President of the United States right the way down to, you know, the person on welfare, that 
you know, when you've got that alignment of interests, all of a sudden I'm I'm really curious to see what we can do as a society, as a species, when everyone is running the the, the same way. But you know, for the time being, until Bitcoin has is ubiquitous across, you know, the globe, we're probably going to see an increasing money grab in the last of days type scenario where people are going to try and get whatever they can before before it runs out. And then that will lead to ultimately a new system, I think, because the old system's unsustainable, the new one is. So we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Crypto is a zero sum game and <laughs> Bitcoin is a positive sum game. Uh, and it's fair. Everyone has to buy by the rules, individuals, nation states. We all play by the same rule set. I, I listened to Twitter spaces last night and Clint was on there and he just said like, the, the thing about Bitcoin is that it's just a set of rules that we all agree to that don't change. And at its core, it's really simple to understand it that way. Uh, a rules-based system, not a ruler-based system. And the crypto bros, uh, they're just taking advantage of asymmetry of information. And yeah, in the long run, uh, I think all of them will be exposed to playing silly games. But it certainly doesn't surprise me because people being people will find any opportunity to exploit others um, for their short-term game. Uh, no, short-term gain and games you could say but um yeah on that very very optimistic note uh have you got any other closing words to leave us with today on the 22nd of august not the 17th as i said from the outset my god <laughs> uh very briefly you're running a bit behind we need to wind the clock forward i think um you know what in light of everything that's going on globally and the rest of it i think it's going to continue to be volatile the most important message tonight, I think, is if you do have coins on exchange, get them off. Reach out to yourself or me, basically just about anyone on Twitter. There's a you know a great crew who can help and support you do that. Basically do that because that's that's the primary risk at the moment. It it just looks and feels so much like FTX. And you know, they're holding a lot of a lot of Bitcoin, upwards of you know, three, four, five hundred thousand Bitcoin, I mm. think. So you know, if that were to go over and those coins were to basically be lost for whatever reason, you know, that's carnage on the market. That's a lot more than FTX had. So I guess that's a message for tonight. Prepare for more volatility. It's bring your hard hat to work week for me or year and uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. ex expect more of the same. So be prepared. Hell yes. Excellent. Uh, I'll put a, I'll put some links in there in the show notes uh, as to how you can get hold of Peter. I'm sure you guys probably know by now where to find him, uh, as well as uh, his business, the Bitcoin Advisor. You guys are absolutely smashing it. You've got some real traction. And uh, I actually mentioned to Andy yesterday, the velocity is just uh, blowing my mind. Like, um, there really seems to be this incredible pace. If you can hit the ground running, it's just like, Honestly, congrats, guys. So uh, from that perspective, I'll put some little, a little, uh, little link there at the bottom. But um, Pete, it's always a pleasure. Hey, thanks so much. I enjoy our chats a lot. And uh, yeah, let's see what the next round of macro brings when we chat again. <laughs> Great to see you, Val. Appreciate your time. Awesome. Cheers, Ed. Bye. Bye thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and that you got some value out of it. Either way, hit me up on Twitter. And let me know what you think. My handle is Dale21M. If you've got any suggestions as to people you think I should be talking to or topics I should address to, I would love that sort of feedback. Otherwise, if you want to support the show, there's a couple different ways you can do that. The first is just to share it amongst your friends and family. The more that people hear the message that Bitcoin and crypto are not the same thing, the better. And I want to help people understand that. The second thing you can do is give me a five-star review on whichever podcast app you're using. Of course, that's only if I deserve it. And last but not least, if you want to stream Satsmoe via the Fountain app, I'm not going to say no, but it's not expected. Thank you so much for your support thus far. It means the world to me. I appreciate the hell out of you and the best is yet to come. Much love, friends. I'll see you on the other side.